The first poem I'm going to read for you comes from my first book, and after that I'll read three new poems from the book that I'm writing at the moment. This poem, Scandinavia, gave me the title for Public Dream, um, and you will hear that phrase occur towards the end of the poem. In a sense, poems are public dreams. They are the products of a particular writer's imaginative existence, but at the same time, they also have value to others and they have a public life of their own. I've never been to Scandinavia, so this poem isn't exactly the travel poem. It sounds like it might be. Um, it's rather a, a poem about travelling inside the imagination. Scandinavia. I think I could be happy there, north of fame, in light unbroken, blending the imagined hours' horizons into sky, sky through soft heaped fields, unclaimed, their rims forever reforming at the wind's deft caprice. I could try to live as a glass of water, utterly clear and somehow restrained, a sip that tells you nothing but perpetuates the being there could sit, lie, settle down, the white of one idea entirely lost upon another, as rain is lost in the shift of the sea, as a single consecrated face drowns in the swell of the Saturday host, and the notion of loving that one critically more than any other flake in a flurry melts, flows back to Folly's pool, the lucid public dream. Okay, um, so that was the, the, last, the last poem from my first book, and now I have three newer poems to read for you. Um, so the title of my second collection, the book that I'm, that I'm working on now, is Disinformation. And disinformation, as, as I'm sure you all know, um, refers to the dissemination of deliberately false information, especially when it's being supplied by a government um, or one of its agents to a foreign power or to the media. I think poetry is often credited with being more truthful than other forms of public discourse, but at the same time it prioritises effects over facts. And I wonder what we are to make of Emily Dickinson's command to tell all the truth, but tell it slant in an age of spin. Poetry can also be an agent and a vessel of disinformation. It is also a bid for authority. This is the title poem of the book, and it captures a moment when somebody realises, possibly for the first time, how manipulated they have been by the streams of information that they use to make sense of their life. Disinformation. I am making jelly for my nephew's fourth birthday party. Any flavour, as long as it's red, Bouncy cubes snipped and stirred into hot water in a cloudy Pyrex dish. Rediscovering the secret of Isinglass, or is it horse gelatin? While a radio announcer intimates that certain unpopular facts about the operations hitherto repressed, like signs removed from crossroads and bridges in occupied lands, can now be revealed if we just stay tuned. Party bags designed to please infants pile on the counter. Two bright colours, badly drawn. Blue napkins, party poppers. My red hands put cylinders of sausage on cocktail sticks. These pass for traditions. And all the time I listen to them talk fluently about foreknowledge, proactivity, stations. It is winter, treacherous to walk. The children are on their way by now, adults too, bundled against the promise of snow. And the entertainer, with tricks and jokes, hidden under a blanket in the boot of his Volvo, limp balloons into which he will blow his lungs full of ideal animals, practices misdirection. I chop yellow cheese, 
Out the kitchen window the whirligig turns, metal spokes merciless as diagrams cutting the air, no clothing softens. Tiny gems icing the nodes where their lines intersect. Every extant leaf is fixed with glitter where the glue's dried clear. Um, this next poem, Story, came from um, thinking about those news stories in which a person has been reported missing. So the coverage starts out by encouraging hope for that person's recovery, um, but the body's absence, which is captivating at first, soon results in this kind of unbearable narrative vacuum at which point the media begin to fill this vacuum with speculations um, until speculation eventually passes for news in itself. Story. Under what tree, in what part of the forest, beside which branch of the leaf-obstructed stream, in sun or in rain, concreted into what foundation, supporting whose house? Deaf to how many dinner parties, subjected to how many holding forths, compacted along with what model of car, with what registration, wearing which perfume and what sort of pearls, in the back of beyond of what country, adjoining whose underdevelopment land, masked by which strain of animal fodder's pollen, blown from the next field along. Belonging to whom, missed by whom, questioned by which particular method, scarred where, repaired where, reopened how, broken how, how taken care of, transported how, buried how, in what manner and from what platform disclaimed, during which international crisis, during which electoral year, under whose watch, under whose watch and why will it surface? Why will it then be permitted to surface? The end of the story, the body we need. Okay. And the last poem um, I'm going to read for you today um, is called A Shrunken Head. In the Pitt Rivers Anthropological Museum in Oxford, there are 10 shrunken human heads. The heads were made made um, by various tribes in Ecuador and Peru. So head shrinking was a very complicated procedure that involved removing the brain and the skull, boiling the skin for a long time, um, and then reshaping the facial features as the head dried. Although the original murder was usually committed for vengeance, the ritual of preservation forged a kinship bond um, between the warrior and his victim. Um, that actually inducted the soul of the victim into the warrior's tribe, which I thought was really interesting. So the curators of the Pitt Rivers Museum have discussed at length whether or not to repatriate the heads back to South America. And this seemed to overlap with wider debates about national identity, migratory culture, and the repatriation and rendition of living people. So my poem imagines that one of the heads is indeed being sent home, whether it wants to go or not. A shrunken head. In the cargo hold, cruising at 30,000 feet above blue islands, galactically cold, I float between Oxford and the site where I was found, then traded on. I cannot see for bubble wrap. At this stage in my repatriation, I belong to no one, a blip, a birdie ounce, in the undercarriage. Only the curator knows I've gone and who is left. She redesigns the tour. Lizard bones replace me. Indigenous crafts distract with dyed feathers from an absence. So in me no memory withstood the leather-thonged, moth-kissed costume of an Eskimo, its upright hood ringed with reindeer fur like frost regarding me for years, without a face, across the Victorian cabinets, or a cruel long spear 
frozen in space, dressed like a wrist with jade and jet. Or Bobo, as I named him, his heavy puss pursed like a clown's, like a freshly sprung mushroom, observing silence. I miss being part of the known quantifiable index, the massive mouths of children smearing the glass case, sometimes shocked and crying, more often delighted to learn of my fate, sneaking pictures for school reports. Their flashes filled me up with light, like water would a calabash, or cauterizing beams from night security did the displays. For hours after, I'd see patterns that couldn't be real. Shadow plays, huge birds fighting each other up the loaded walls. I'd imagine hands to rub my eyelids with, lift them, and feel the cross stitches holding me in. My vengeful breath trapped beneath their seals, wanting for the first time in lifetimes to exhale, to spit red berries or the prattle of a curse then that would fail in the force of my several injuries and I'd seem to drop towards a far ocean, armless, footless, a seed head blown without will or hope or wishing upon through the middle of a crown to land on my shelf under rows of wooden masks and blown bird's eggs, smelling the open jar of myself, salt sweet as tamarisk, mildest fix. Thank you very much.